God, our prayer is that we come here this morning, that we open our hearts, and that we listen to what you have to say, and that we will listen to the convictions from your Holy Spirit, and that we will leave here encouraged by your word, and at the same time challenged uh, to live differently. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, if you've got your Bibles, we're going to go open them up right up to Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, verse 1. That's on page 954. If you're looking up on the screen, it gets kind of confusing because I got the road map up there. All right, so we got the New Testament, the Matthew, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and then you see GEPC, okay? And if you remember, does any, we got a couple quizzes this morning. Does anybody remember the acronym for GEPC? Excellent, darling. Go eat popcorn. Exactly. Go eat popcorn, or better known as Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. But those are the really small ones in between First and Second Thessalonians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians will be in Colossians. Now, this is a two-part series. Last week, we were talking about something, and again, quiz, and I strongly encourage you looking in your notes. That's not considered cheating. If you took notes last week, that's encouraged. Last week's sermon title was Finish strong. Good job. Somebody's paying attention. Very good. Finish strong. We're talking about how we, we come to start believing and, 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 and confessing Christ as Lord, and we repent from our sins, but then we stop, and we don't fully obey the gospel message to be baptized. And so we talked about last week what it means to become a Christian and what that looks like. And, and for a lot of people, coming to Christ is, is the end, and, and, and that's why at the end of the sermon I said finish strong is a bad title because it's, it's not the end, it's just the beginning. See, coming to Christ is just the beginning. Coming to Christ is just the beginning of your walk with Him. I think all too often becoming a Christian becomes like a, a get out of jail free card. How many of you are Monopoly fans? Any Monopoly? Any, how many of you actually played a real full game of Monopoly? A full one? Dave, can you verify that? Okay, <laughs> good enough. That's a long game, and you're very, very focused, Juliana. Uh, but in Monopoly, you can get, if you're lucky, you can get a get-out-of-jail-free card. And that's $50 value. You get it from Community Chester Chance, and you get the get-out-of-jail-free card. And you hold that just in case you go to jail. Then you can get out of jail for free. You hold on to it, and when you need it, you use it. Sounds like salvation for some, doesn't it? You get your salvation card, you get your get out of hell free card, and you put it in your wallet in between your AAA membership and your health insurance. In case the car breaks down, I got my AAA. In case I get sick, I got my health insurance. And in case I die, I've got my Jesus card. So I'm going to heaven. I'm set. And that's it. You accept Christ as your life, you stick it in your wallet, and you're done. That get out of jail free card, that get out of hell free card, that's the wrong mentality about becoming a Christian. When you come to Christ, it's just the beginning of a life of service, of a life of growth, of witnessing. There's so much more that, Paul, that God has for us in our lives. And so in our Bibles today, what we're going to read is in the book of Colossians chapter 2. Paul is writing this letter to a church. It's a church that he did not start. Uh, some of his early Christian converts did, Epaphras and some others. They've started this church, and he's writing from Rome. He's in prison. Big shock there. Paul's usually in prison for preaching the gospel. And he's writing, and he's addressing the specific problem that people are infiltrating the church with smooth-sounding arguments, things that sound really good and really clever. And they're well-thought-out, highly-educated people, but they're not biblical. They're not true, and so they're deceiving these Christians. And so Paul is writing to them to correct this error and bring them back on to track of what it means to be a Christian. So chapter 2, we're going to pick the read in verse 1, and, and there's a word in here, and I want you to understand it, contending. When we get to this word, contending, Paul is agonizing. He's really desiring this a lot. Here we go, chapter 2, verse 1. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you. I'm in agony for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know in the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Here it is. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you with fine-sounding arguments. Don't be deceived by those. 
For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit. And I delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. What a compliment. These, these Christians are doing good. And Paul is excited, but he's still concerned because there are some who are coming in to kind of bring in some heresy, some lies. So he's telling them to be, be on their guard. And he continues to read, uh, continues right there in verse 6. So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, you've become a Christian, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and being built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than Christ. Again, he's repeating verse 4, verse 4 and verse 8. Don't be uh, deceived by fine sign and arguments or hollow and deceptive philosophy. Instead, verse, verse 9, for in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. We are in Christ, and the rest of the, the, the 11 through 15 here focus on what is different because we're in Christ. Verse 13 kind of sums it up. Verse 13, when you were dead in your sins, you used to be in your sins, and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us our sins. It's been changed. Life has been changed because we have received Christ. Verse 6, go up to verse 6. So then, just as you have received Christ as Lord, these Christians have received Christ as Lord. They're Christians. They're new believers. Something has changed in their life. Christ has filled their lives. They have been made different because of what they've chosen. Look down at verse 13. Again, it's the same thing that we saw in Acts chapter 2. Verse 13, you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Here it is. But God made you alive with Christ. The first thing, God makes you alive with Christ. And he forgives us all our sins. The two things, do you remember Acts 2.38? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. What two things do we receive? We receive forgiveness of sin. Our debt is canceled. We're no longer going to hell because of what Christ did, and we accept that gift. Forgiveness of sin and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, right here in verse 13. God makes you alive with Christ. We are indwelled with Christ, with the Holy Spirit, and he forgives us of our sins. The same thing. These are Christians. These people have received Christ. They're Christians. Christ has filled them completely. Look at verse 10. In Christ, you've been brought to fullness. Christ has completely filled their lives. They're believers. This is an important note. They can now stop searching the world to fill the God-shaped hole in their lives. They no longer have to pursue money, power, whatever God they want to serve. They don't have to do that anymore because they've been brought to fullness in Christ. What a blessing that these Christians have experienced that we as Christians have also experienced if we've chosen to receive Christ as Lord. But they started the process. Okay, so they chose Christ as Lord. They were obedient to the gospel. Now they're called to, verse 6, to continue to live your lives in him, to continue in him. As you read through this passage of scripture, in him shows up again and again and again, verse 6, 7, 9, 10, 11, and 15. I think I see a pattern showing up here. That we're to be in Christ because when we're in Christ, we are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come, and so we are, we are different. We're in Christ. Christ has filled our lives. We are adopted as sons and daughters of God. We are in Christ. Something is different about us, and so it should be evident in the way we live. That our old sinful self, verse 13, we used to live in sin. That's gone. Now we live in Christ. So we want to continue to do that. So what does that look like? How, how does that uh, show itself in our lives? Well, let's look at what verse 6 says, because it gives us some very plain and good instructions here. Just as you receive Christ as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him. Rooted in Christ. This Greek word here, it's a perfect participle, indicating a past action with present effects. Something that happened in the past but continues every day forward. I became a Christian, I received Christ as Lord, and I continue to grow in him every day. Think about a plant. You plant a plant and it, it takes root and it grows. You might not see the roots growing, but they're growing. 
Ever since you planted that plant, that tree, the roots continue to grow. Think about a tree for a second. The roots serve two functions. Maybe more than that, but I'm just talking about two this morning. They anchor the tree to the ground, and they provide nourishment. That's a good illustration. Good word you chose here, Paul. Because when we think about our lives, we need to be anchored in Christ as he provides our nourishment for continued growth. I know that's a lot to write in the blanks, but fill that one in because I think it's important. We are anchored in Christ and he provides our nourishment for continued growth. We are rooted in Christ. We are, we are firmly established in Christ because of what he has done for us. When we accept him as a Lord and Savior, we are anchored in him. But it, it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop at just being anchored in Christ. We need to continue to go back to Christ and continue to walk in Christ for continued nourishment and, uh, and, and strengthening in our faith. How about, how many of you enjoy gardening? Does anybody here enjoy gardening? I don't see a lot of hands. Okay, I'm with the majority. Some of you, there's a guy that lives right next to the library and he's out frequently and he is gardening and he is just in the zone. I walked by the other day, just yesterday, and he's out there and he is just, it looks like he's just having a great time. That's weird. I don't understand what's up with that. But, okay, so think about gardening here for a second. I'm not insulting any of you gardeners. It's just not my spiritual gift. When is the best time to pull a weed? When is the best time to pull a weed? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> That's a good answer. Actually, the question is incredibly flawed. Uh, never. You should just get the weed whacker out and just, just tear them all down. That's what you should do with weeds. That's the proper... But if you're pulling your weeds from your garden, the best time is when they're, when they're young, when they're early. Because you can get them when they're just a little bitty weed. You just pop it right out. Not a big deal. But what if you wait and wait and you come back from vacation from Florida <laughs> and you have a jungle? What do you do then? Well, you got to get on your hands and knees and you got to get your leather gloves on and you got to get them all out. And you make sure you get the roots. Because if you don't get the roots, that weed is going to come back. How about a tree? How many of you have ever tried to get a tree root out or a tree stump? You got that tree stump in your backyard that's been there for 50 years. It's been there for a long time, and you, you chop on it with your axe, and you burn a campfire on it, and it's still there. That's a hard work. Why? Because those roots have been there for a long time. We have been anchored in Christ, but we need to continue to grow in Christ for more nourishment, to become a solid oak tree. See, I don't want my, my spiritual life to look like a dandelion. I want my spiritual life to look like a solid oak tree that's been there, that keeps going to the soil, to the source, to the Bible for nourishment, that gets healthy and strong. And then when the storms come, I can stand strong because I've anchored myself in Christ and I've continued to look to him for nourishment. The Bible here in verse 6, it says, that we're to be rooted in him and continue to be built up in him and strengthen our faith. Being built up, these are, these are present participles, indicating continuous actions, things that we continue to do every day that we continue to build on our faith, that we nourish our faith. And so the Bible tells us we come to Christ and then we continue to grow in him. Oh, well, how do we do that? What are some practical ways we can do that? In your Bible, you're in chapter 2, go to chapter 3. Go to chapter 3 and go to verse 16. Verse 16. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. So we sing. Singing is good. We just did a bunch of that. That's good. It's very spiritually edifying. But the beginning of verse 16. Let the message, maybe your translation says, let the word of Christ dwell among you Richly, let the Bible, let the God's message, let Christ's message dwell among you richly. Is that the word, the phrase that you would use to describe your, your quiet time, your, your Bible reading habits, that God's word dwells among us richly? Listen to verse 5. I think this is a great compliment to the Christians at Colossae. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delighted to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. Paul's given him a, a way to go. Good job. You're doing a great job at building on the foundation that Christ has given us. This church is doing good. They have made Bible reading or, or, or studying the scriptures because they didn't have the Bible. They had the letters that 
that they received the apostles' teaching? They made that a priority in their life. Is this book a priority in our lives? Would your Bible reading look like a salad oak tree or dandelion? When the storms of life come through, do you just get shaken to the core? Verse this, if this is the priority, it's going to help us in life. It's going to benefit our lives so much. It's going to strengthen our lives so much. Both time you were talking about the persecuted church. It's true. That, that's, that's going on right now. Where it is illegal to own a Bible. We don't have that problem here. We can own Bibles. We can have lots of Bibles. I would venture to say that most of us probably have more than two, four, ten more than 10 Bibles, the, the most published book, but the least read. Look, I hope that's not true. It's not illegal in our country. But we have, we have the excuses. I don't have enough time. Now that school's back in session, I don't have enough time. It, it, that's not anybody's excuse, but it might be your excuse. Is it time or is it priorities? Because I have time to do other things, but I don't have time to read my Bible. I, 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 I do make the time to read my scriptures. Do we make the time? It's a priority. How about, um, it's hard to read and understand. You're right. It's difficult sometimes. It's challenging. These are letters that were written to specific people a long time ago. So there are times where it's kind of challenging. A couple weeks ago, I had somebody come to me and say, hey, I want to start reading my Bible. That's a good thing. And we strongly encourage that. And she said, but sometimes it's challenging. And I said, okay, well, let's, let's talk about it. Because this, what we have here, there's multiple different versions of Bibles. Some are easier to understand than others. Some are more literal translations, meaning word for word, or some are phrase by phrase. And so there's a ton of different Bible studies and resources and translations. I could talk for a long time and make you really bored about the different kind of Bible studies that are out there. Why? Because I want you to read it. Find one that's good for you and read it. And parents, this is important. Okay, parents, this is, it is important for us to teach our kids to enjoy to read. Because if they enjoy to read, then when we send them off on their own and we give them a Bible, they'll enjoy to read that as well. If they can't stand to read any book, then what's going to help their success in reading, reading this? All the educators in the room are like, yes, reading. Very good. Exactly, Shelley. But it's more than that. Because if we can teach our kids to enjoy reading, then later in life when they get this and they're by themselves and they say, you know what, I'm going to continue to read this because I like to read and, and I like to read this because this is different than any book I've ever read because this is active and alive and it cuts to the heart because it's God's true word. And so we need to teach our kids to read and we need to teach our kids to enjoy reading the scriptures, because we enjoy it as well. Does the message of Christ dwell among us richly? If not, let's do some, some work on that. Let's put the Bible back in its proper place in our lives. And there's more to this. As we, as we study the Bible on our own, let's do this. Let's study the Bible together in small groups. Get involved with small groups. Now, that's not in the scriptures right here in this part, but as we talk about building our, our faith up and strengthening our faith, what better way than to do that through small groups? We've got the Acts of God small group Bible study coming up here. I'm really excited about that. You saw the trailer. Tonight we're watching the movie. I encourage you, be here. Uh, bring a box of Kleenexes because it will, man, I didn't think I made 10 minutes and I was just bawling my eyes out. Because the movie very accurately portrays people who are hurting. And what do we as Christians say to them? How can we minister to them? How, what do we say? Where's God? We need to be here. We need to study this. We need to be here. It's, it's six weeks. We're going to study for six weeks. Dave's class is meeting in the morning on Sunday morning. Mine is on Wednesday night. Next Sunday and next Wednesday, tonight's the movie. But let's get involved. Let's get involved with the small groups. Let's be there. Let's let the word of God uh, flow in our lives and, and be an encouragement to others. And, and if you say, you know, I don't have time for small groups, that's priorities. I know enough that's get out of jail free mentality. We don't know enough. We can continue to go. I know everything. I already know enough. To, well, then you come and you teach the class because I don't know everything and I need some help. But I really like small groups because it's encouraging to see you share. It's those aha moments. 
you know, where, where I'm up here just talking and talking, and some of you are listening, and some of you are, we'll come back, okay. But it's cool on Wednesday nights, because you, you catch it, and you get it, and I see that light bulb go off, and you go, oh, this is, this is, and you start teaching the class, and I just step back, and it's, it's very encouraging, and you share with the group, and you're beaming from ear to ear, and everybody else is like, yeah, that's a cool moment. Get involved in small groups. Sunday morning, Wednesday night. Be involved with small groups. The goal of this sermon is to make you feel guilty. So I'm hoping that it's working. I hope you feel guilty and you just reluctantly feel like signing up for small groups. Because at this time, we're going to have the deacons come forward with a clipboard. We're going to pass it around and make you sign up. No, that's not going to (laughs) happen. Dave's like, that's a great idea. (laughs) We're not doing that. I want you to write this word down. Write down the word compulsion. Compulsion. Compulsion is the action or state of being forced. Forced to do something. You better sign up for small groups. Or I'm going to keep preaching about it for another two weeks. Compulsion. Listen to 2 Corinthians. Write this down. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God doesn't want your guilt money. When you pass the trays, oh, I should probably put some money in. Here you go, God, because I love you. That's compulsion. He doesn't want that. Oh, preaching about small groups, getting involved. He doesn't want that. God wants you to be involved in small groups because you desire to grow. The, the whole, the, the, the movie posters, you've seen the movie posters. On the bottom of the movie poster, in big, bold letters. This is great, Kevin. I did the same thing. I made a Facebook event, put it out there. It says, free movie. Why does it have to be free? We're, we're going to get some ice cream tonight. Why do we have to bring ice cream? What, are we bribing you? And we should say movie, 12 bucks. Kale and tap water will follow. And if you don't like kale, we'll bring some broccoli. This is what I'm thinking. We're pack the house, Dave. You're like, I got tons of friends who are coming. Why do we have to, to butter up uh, butter, popcorn? Why do we have to do that for, for, for learning? Look, we want to grow in Christ. We should just want to come. I want to learn. Church should be packed because we desire to grow in Christ because we want this. I'm still going to eat ice cream, and I'm still going to bring it tonight, and it'll still taste really good. So be here tonight for the ice cream. Well, let's come because we want to learn, because we want to grow, because it's the only logical thing that makes sense. We come to Christ, he calls us to grow, and we do it joyfully. Listen to verse 6 and 7 again. So then, you received Christ as Lord, you've come to Christ. Continue to live your lives in him, rooted up and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. It's the only logical response to the cross is a life of gratitude. That's the only thing that makes sense. The only logical response to the cross is a life of gratitude. He died on the cross for our sins. All we can say is thank you. All we can do is live a life of gratitude, a life that says thank you and I appreciate what you did. And so I give back to you my money. 2 Corinthians. I give back to you my time. I give back to you my, my willingness to learn. I give back to you my, my worship through Bible study. I give back to you because I love. Not because I owe you. Look, we owe God big, big time. But we can never pay him back. And that's the thing. He doesn't expect us to pay him back. He's not up in heaven saying, come on, give a little bit more. Give a little bit more because you can never make it, but you keep trying. He's not, he doesn't expect us to do that. He wants us to give to him in love. It's like when you give your kids presents. You give your children and your parents Christmas time. You're giving people presents. 383 Huffman Street. You can mail it. It's fine. Okay. You give people presents. Stacy, you're right on. You got it. You give them presents because you love them, because you care about them. But how many of you, when you, when you write a bill to the gas company, with love from your friend, Mike. No, you don't do that. That's obligation. That's because you owe the gas company. And so you send them the bill, and here's the money. Enjoy your, your gift. 
But when you give a gift to your family, it's out of love. And so when we give worship to God, it's out of love. It's not a gas bill we're paying. It's out of love and respect to him that we say, you know what? It's out of gratitude for the cross that I give you my study time, that I give you my time to worship you. A big difference between obligation and out of love. The, um, this is the, out, of oblig- or out of gratitude, we, uh, we want to learn, we want to grow more. And so we're filled with gratitude and our salvation is made complete. This is, this is an encouraging verse. Listen to verse 10. In Christ, you've been brought to fullness. That's it, right there. In Christ, you've been brought to fullness. This is like the, the underlying bold capital letters. This is the highlighting of the fact that we are excited and that we are thankful to the cross because our salvation is complete. Our salvation is complete in Christ. There's nothing that we... We are obedient to the gospel. We receive Christ, and then it's done. Were you obedient to the gospel? Yes. Then it's 100% done. Were you not obedient to the gospel? Well, not completely. Then finish strong and be completely obedient, and then Christ will do 100% of the work. It's done. We don't have to continue to learn to save ourselves. We don't have to continue to give to save ourselves. These things don't save us. Christ filled our lives. He fulfilled us. He's one who saved us. It's not like a pie chart where there's like what Jesus did and then what I did and then what I have left to do. It's not like that. It's just all Jesus doing 100% of the saving. He's the one who's brought us to full salvation. Praise God for that. That is a continued reminder of the thankful heart that we should have for him. Let me give you one more why. One more why we need to study. One more why we need to grow in the word and uh, and, and in our faith. One more why it's better to be a solid oak tree than a dandelion. Listen to verse 4 again. Chapter 2, verse 4. I tell you this, so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. Verse 8. See to it, that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Not much has changed, has it, church? There were people sneaking into the church and deceiving the believers back then, and there are people sneaking into the church and deceiving believers today. Smooth-sounded arguments. Highly educated people. Lots of people listen to them. We should listen to them too. And society comes in and takes the Bible and says, eh, we're going to translate this differently. And, and, and if, if you become pregnant and you just, it's not a convenient time to be pregnant, well, you can take care of that. That disagrees with the Bible. So we're not going to do that. Oh, society says, well, you know, there's, there's options in life now with families. You know, options like marriage. Marriage is an option. You don't really need to get married. And, and, and sex, sex is an option. You can, you can enjoy that whenever with whoever. That's an option. And pornography, that's an option. And, and, and gender, you can pick any gender you want as per society's definition. But I look at Scripture, and that's not what this says. You can package those ideas as clever as you want them, but if it doesn't agree with this, then I'm not going to buy this. Listen, God created the earth in six days, six literal days. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. It doesn't make sense. That's why it's a miracle. But it's what God did. Oh, God's dead. God's not dead. I'm sorry. God's not dead. God is all-powerful, all-loving, and is in control of this universe. So then why did bad things happen to my loved one? Good question. We've got a small group that's waiting for you. We're going to talk about that. We're going to discuss that. We need to grow in this so that when someone challenges our faith, when they push us, when they try to uproot us as a little dandelion, we can say, listen, I'm a firm oak and I am solidly planted in the ground on this. I'm anchored in Christ where I find my nourishment and I am not moving at all. We need to grow in our faith so that no one may take us captive through lies. We need to grow in our faith so no one may take us captive through lies. That's what we need. That's what we need to pursue. And so we as a church, we're going to live out verse 6 and 7. We're going to come to Christ, and then we're going to grow in Christ with a thankful heart. Read verse 
6 and 7 again, because reading scripture is it's a good idea. So then, just as you received Christ as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Thank God for Jesus Christ.